I think we're starting now. Yeah, I'm just waiting for Karthik signal. All right. All right. All right. Good, good, good evening, evening, good everybody. evening, everybody. Welcome to our heat of this, 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 Hi, Rob. How are you doing? Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Thanks very much. I'm like, 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 I'm I was I was drawing ever since I know myself. So I was drawing as as a little kid or a little kid already always taking uh, the taking extra papers, uh, the of, extra papers of my mom and, and just filling it up. And throughout the years came, came and when I started my university came, came and pushed me. I started in computer sciences and very quickly I realized okay that's that's not for me. So, so I decided to mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering at least had a bit of technical drawing in it. So I thought I would enjoy. So I thought I would enjoy that. Indeed, I did enjoy. Indeed, I did enjoy uh, during my uh, mechanical engineering studies, I started drawing. Studies, I started drawing more and more, and I got more into CAD well because mm -hmm. internet became more prevalent. So I, I could see a lot of concept artists. I think that's the first time I saw somebody mention industrial design uh, within their sketches. And I really liked their sketches because it was straight lines and whatnot. So I started searching the term industrial design and I, I saw more and more sketches that really spoke to me and the type of sketches that, that, that I liked and I wanted to do. And after I was done with my studies, I decided, okay, I wanted to do industrial design somewhere in the West. And I got a year internship in Germany and then during my year internship in Germany the TU Delft and I signed up and I started uh, studying there so it, it it was it was mostly through my love of, of design and then obviously at, uh, at the university I learned very quickly that industrial design is not just uh, sketching but a whole lot of uh, other things but but my but my love of sketching always stayed so uh, I would say I'm, I'm still more of a person who loves drawing and then uses industrial design to push his drawing forward. Uh, and then if we talk about, uh, you asked us about how, why I started uploading stuff yeah. to social media, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was just, I was always sharing my drawings, like even back uh, when I was still, when I just started my first year in uni. Uh, I started sharing a couple of drawings here and there on blog spots or on, on, on different drawing portals. And I guess when I finished industrial design, Instagram started, well, I, it was already big, but that's when I noticed it. I was like, okay, let me just share a couple of things here. And mm -hmm. I had a YouTube channel for the longest time, but people started asking me on Instagram, like, how do you do this and that? I thought, okay, this, other people do videos as well. so. Just for fun, I shared, started sharing videos. And I think I, that went on for a year before I decided to go freelance. And when I went freelance, obviously I didn't have a lot of jobs in the beginning, so I just had extra time to put into Instagram and YouTube. So that's, that's how I built up sort of a consistent posting schedule and pushing myself to, to keep on posting uh, more and more. And I just really enjoyed I always, I always like sharing the knowledge that I have. And at that point I thought like, okay, there's, there's a lot of things that I learned at, at the uni about industrial design sketching. And why not just put 
that out there. And so that's that's sort of the, the whole back out of, of my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. no, and I think a lot of us relate yes. with most of us. Start, yeah. mm -hmm. So uh, the next question that we go is, um, according to you, what does it mean to be a freelance industrial designer? Did you be a freelance mm -hmm. industrial designer? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would say what what it means. I would say what what it means. Say what what it means to be a industrial designer. So many so many things. And they when you finish finish a design, you have so many tools at your disposal. So I would say it means that you take the tools that you need to do whatever you need to do to be able to be a freelancer. The thing is, when you're industrial, when when there's a company who needs something done, they need a quick design. They have a a product that they want to develop, there's already two options. Either they have an in-house designer or it's a big company and they're going to approach uh, an industrial design uh, agency. So it's going to be really, really hard for you as a freelance industrial designer to push yourself in between the two and, and convince the company that they have to do it. Because usually the company wants a solution all the way from A to B. And yes, industrial designers are generalists. But you're not going to be able to say, okay, so um, uh, we need a new, uh, I, I don't know, we need a new device for this company, and you have to think about electronics, you have to think about shape, language, you need to think about production, how to produce it, and you also, well, usually because of that, also need to think about marketing, how to market, what the user do, do the proper user research, do the ergonomics, all those things, right? So as one person, as a freelancer, you won't be able to do that. So the best thing is either to find a niche where you can use your tools, and that's sort of what I'm doing because I specialize in, in uh, visual thinking and visual communication. So I took all the tools that industrial design taught me, and I'm applying in sort of a field where I help people design their strategies and, and design within the company, like in which way they want to go with, with towards the future. Like, uh, uh, what are the new strategies, what is the vision for their company, and I sort of use my visual knowledge and, and everything I learned on industrial design to be able to facilitate them and create this, this visual representation of their what they want to do, of their strategy. So this is one way, but you can also specialize on, on specific things that either uh, the industrial design agencies will hire you in to, to specifically for those things, or they will hire you in. But it is very hard and I don't really know freelance industrial designers who call themselves freelance industrial design. I have friends with whom I studied industrial design and a couple of them went into uh, furniture. So they just started building furniture and, and, and that's how they grow. But I don't know if that can be necessarily called freelance industrial design. I don't know if that... Uh, that is it true online portals or is there a better way to do it? I would say, I would say, I would say, don't do free 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 dancing. Just finish your story. Just finish your story. As a freelance designer, as a freelance designer, why would the company would come to you who have no experience with all experience with all experience over experience designers? I would say, I would say, try to get into. Get industrial design, industrial design. Like I wouldn't, like I wouldn't, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you, I mean yeah, you, you can have some social media, everything is about it. Everything is about it. As soon as you finish, as soon as you finish, you realize, 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 you get one or two uh, internships below you because mm-hmm. it's so for the few for your future what is the most important thing to sort of answer your question is networking and your network and the people who you know so if you if you do an internship at an industrial design agency you have already chances to work for that agency if they like obviously you have to do your best and if they like you you have the chances to work there but even if not with the internship there you worked for different clients and they might remember you so you can say hey i worked an internship here do you need somebody who can do this or that or that for you yeah. so i would recommend don't think about freelance because you just don't have the experience because as a freelancer you're not an industrial designer you're a company owner which means you have to do your own marketing you have to do your own acquisition you have to do your own sales and then you also have to do the work and then you have to do after calls with the client. So okay. you, you, you don't start freelancing as an industrial designer. You start freelancing as somebody who just started up their own company. So it's much, much sure. more complicated and harder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your process? Like uh, when you're approached with a design problem, how do you, you know, kind of go about it? Yeah, uh, it's... Uh, it's Sorry again for interrupting, but uh, the echo thing is still happening. So if let's say he rhythm is speaking up, uh, Robert, could you also turn off your mic so that only one? Sure. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. Okay. So um, my process is basically the the typical design process approach that 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 you probably know with the empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, and then implement. But then because I work a lot in this visual thinking uh, thing. We use the something called the, the double diamond, uh, which is. Uh, can I share my screen because then I can just uh, post something over here and show you guys. Yeah, let me, go ahead. Yeah. Let me click the share button. There we go. And so it's basically. I zoom in. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So it's sort of this double. Diamond. So it's sort of this double diamond thing um, where we um, start. Uh, we start diverging, uh, and, diverging that's and that's basically the discovering phase. But it's also where you go into a group with the people and then you just start putting post-its on the wall with all sorts of ideas. And then where you diverge enough, then you start converging again. That's when the first mm-hmm. diamond sort of ends. And then you start clustering all the ideas. You start defining, OK, what are the main things that we want to take? And then until you start cutting away a lot of things that you don't need anymore. Then sort of the developing phase comes where you say, OK, we have three main clusters and these we can work out and then you start doing okay quick sketches quick uh, rapid prototyping testing with users if they're uh, available and then sort of you you can come up with one and maybe a backup product but usually it's a one main idea that you have and then you start um, converging again which is okay trying to nail it down as much as possible this uh, this product in the end, yeah. and stop sharing because you don't need to see that. Thing that I, uh, I think somebody from the, the TU Delft uh, uh, developed is called vision in product design. And it's mm-hmm. basically you go through product level, interaction level, and context level. So you take something like, uh, let's say, a scooter. So you deconstruct the scooter on the product level. What are the elements? How does it work? 
then you go to the interaction level where you think about, okay, what is the interaction between the user? Like, how do you use it? What is it used for? Transportation. Here it's mostly for transportation. In many Asian countries, it's used for every day because those are the, the main uh, uh, transportation devices. And then the context level is also, for example, yeah, in Asia, it has a completely different context using a scooter mm -hmm. than it has in Europe. Now, now that we deconstructed it, you imagine a future context. You say, let's say 200, 2100, how, what is the context there? You sort of imagine the world then. Then you imagine what sort of uh, interaction you need there. Then you, you have this futuristic world, what sort of interactions are necessary to be done. And then you imagine the product. What product can satisfy these interactions? So now you have this future world and you have the modern world. And because this future world is, yeah, you can't really do that. You're trying to find a solution in the middle. So you take some of the idea from the future and you take uh, technologies and solutions that we have right now or we will have in a couple of years. And then we try to bring the two together. So this is, this is my other favorite uh, um, way to, to but, well, my process. But this, this you, you only can use uh, sometimes. You don't, you're not able to use all, all the time. real world design uh, yes I, I think also like this process that i just presented is, is pretty much that it's sort of a concept but to make yeah. it simpler to, to make it simpler and more evident as well if you think about the the automotive industry like we always have these new fancy concept cars that don't really ever get produced but they take many elements from these concept cars that end up in your production vehicle. So the, the thing with concept art and also concept cards or concept design is that you want to unshackle yourself from, from the things that hold you back right now. And you just want to have free uh, freedom in envisioning what the future could be. And then you make this concept car and then you say, okay, like these are really cool ideas. What could we do? So what can we actually take from it and, and develop it? So I, I totally agree with your statement that, that the concept design is sort of forerunning actual design. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we're talking about uh, concept design, do you think sketching uh, is an indispensable tool for designers or can people really do without it? You know? um, I would say, I, I don't think I would say it's indispensable. I think it's, it's very useful, but it's not indispensable. Mm -hmm. I just remember at our university, uh, one of my good friends, uh, Venkatesh, he's also from India, and he came. He also studied mechanical engineering for his bachelor's, and he came here uh, for the industrial design master's. And he didn't know how to sketch. He never sketched in his life, and he didn't like sketching necessarily. He did learn it a little bit to use it here and there, but he started up a company. He created an inkless jet and without actually using sketching. So you can go far. I also had friends who jumped immediately into uh, 3D mockups. So they, mm -hmm. they didn't sketch, they just, they were very good with 3D programs and very quickly it could do 3D stuff. So no, it's not necessary, but it helps you communicate and it helps you communicate with others, but also just communicate your ideas and your vision. So it's helpful, but I don't think it's, it's indispensable. Okay, right. cool. Um... And then, uh, especially with the uh, whole uh, quarantine situation, everybody's indoors. Uh, everybody lacks a little bit of inspiration every now and then. We have our creative blocks, right? And um, so how do we, you know, kind of overcome those and keep at it? And uh, like when it comes to creative blocks, there's multiple facets to it, right? So either you don't have ideas at all or uh, you have ideas, but you don't know how to, you know, kind of, uh, illustrate them or put them down on paper so and especially with the concept art that you do like how do you um, sketch or illustrate things which are which do not necessarily exist you know like um, how, what's the process like behind that uh yeah <laughs> uh 
Yeah, so there's this, I feel like there's this two sort of blocks, like one is art block and one is the, the creative block. Art block mm -hmm. is the easier for me because that is really just drawing related. And then for me, is so, so the one thing is just you have to draw through it, but how do you get down to even start drawing? And then for me, the easiest process is to just do a study of something. Like I, I, I can't come up with a new idea until I'm at least able to draw. So I say, okay, so then let's just take a product I like, or let's take a weird product that I never drew before, and I start drawing that. And as, as soon as I drew it from one or two angles, or I drew one or two products, I'm at least already in a flow of drawing. And from there on, then you can go into breaking up the, the creative block as well. And when it comes to new ideas, it's like you never really come up with new ideas for nothing. You usually have a problem statement. And then it's easier to find solutions for a problem than to come up with an idea from nothing. So if you already have a problem statement, you can look at different solutions for similar products, at least. And then from there, you can start combining. You can also just really do different sort of uh, design exercises that will help you just do a mind map, throw out things on the wall. It's the hardest part is just to get yourself, get that push get that push in to, to, to start working. And that's why for me, since in general, I like drawing, even if I have an art block, the easiest for me is, okay, let me just start with a study of something. And from there on, I can do something. So if you're not necessarily a drawing person, I would say, okay, maybe just sit down and start doing research into products that you like. And then you find a couple of interesting products and then you can go dig a little bit deeper. Okay, what are the specific problems that the product solves? How do they solve it? What were their approaches? Maybe you can find an interesting design journey to see where they had issues. And stuff like that can give you one inspiration, but to also just motivate you, okay, I, I, I want to do something like this as well. And then from there on, I feel like it's, it's rolling better. So I, I hope this sort of answers your question. Yeah, no, that definitely answers my question. And uh, I think Pragya has a few questions. For you now. Go ahead. So, hello, Robert. Um, um, we all know prototyping is a very important part in uh, of the design process. But uh, now and then, we all face this question: when to move to the prototyping stage? So, at what stage in a project do you feel the need to prototype? And do you think digital prototyping can compensate for the physical mockups? Uh, hey, Pragya, thank you for the question. Um, I would say, so prototyping, the definition is like you want to test something. You want to break something as soon as possible so you think, so you see where it breaks, so you see where, where the problems are, so you can fix it. And I do not necessarily think digital prototypes will be enough unless you're doing digital stuff. So if you're, if you're doing a digital product, then yeah, if you whip up a, a quick app, and test it with people, totally fine. But the main thing, especially when you're doing traditional product design, you need to do user tests and use, yeah, you need to test uh, how, how people react to your product. So for that, you will need some sort of, of physical, even if it's just a couple of cardboard boxes put together, just to put the person into, into that context. So I think it's, it's very, very necessary to have, if you're doing physical design, to have a physical product. And I forgot what the second part of your question was, sorry. So at what stage do you move uh, in, the in the whole design process? Do you move to prototyping? Do you feel the need that we need to prototype now? Um, yeah, I, I would say when you feel that you either don't know nothing, no, don't know something about how the user would interact with different elements or you want to see basically how it functions because yeah, you, I would say as soon as you're, well, if you look at the double diamond uh, thing, as soon as you're done with the first converging and going towards the second diverging, that's where you can start uh, doing the prototypes. That's, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, many of our uh, audience, they want to see some of your creations that you are most proud of, or you had fun making. So something you would like to talk about or uh, share with us? <sighs> all right, all right. Let me okay, let me clear this up so I see better. Um, so what something that's fun is, uh, and it's also actually product design, is 
and let me share it. So I've been working with this company here in Amsterdam and they are doing uh, a drinkable bottle, but it's made out of uh, bioplastics. Uh, bioplastics, I think 90, more than 95% of it is the bioplastics, also sugar bamboo uh, and stuff like that. So the idea is to not throw it away. It's re reusable, it's pre-filled with uh, water. And I had to come up with sort of a, the, the shape form, form giving for it. So we went through a couple of uh, iterations until we came to this shape. And together with, uh, with another graphic designer, uh, we came up with uh, uh, the different city names and how it should look like. And I think it's just some sort of a, it's a feel, feel good sort of project for me because in the end you do something good for nature as well. You don't just make a nice product. Uh, and then another, uh, interesting thing is, uh, if we talk about, oh, let's zoom in, if we talk about concept art, is I worked for a game development company, and I did a couple of uh, props, and props within games are basic. So that's, if you're, if you're an industrial designer, the best thing you can do is machines, robots, or props for video games. And I think I'm actually, I forgot to put it up here, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. Uh, give me one second. Let me unshare. So basically, it was uh, this. This this was as a prop designer. You let me zoom in. Let me see. Yeah, that works better. So as a prop designer, you do a quick sketch, and then you also do the whole nice rendering. And then this goes to the 3D artist, well, not the 3D artist, but the person who does the the props in 3D. And then that gets into the game. So my work here was I did a couple of of uh, the houses wall and elements, uh, furniture, and this was all for Horizon Zero Dawn for the PlayStation 4. So this was a really fun also because I learned immensely. I learned immensely and also worked for the previous game for uh, Kills on Shadowfall. So really, I really, really, this, during this, this work, I learned so much about Photoshop, so much about visual communication that, that it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. And like, I think these are the, the two ones that I would say were really, really, be fun. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question because we designers are sort of the tools because people come to us, we need this sort of product, that sort of product. So we have to, whenever we design something, we have to make sure that it is sustainable, it is circular, especially now everything tries to be circular. So one of the good thing, good thing that we can do is stay, stay sort of, contact with each other and always be part of a community where you learn new things about what, what, what sort of new technologies are there that's, uh, that are sustainable, what, what sort of new uh, circular ways can you build up things. And it's, it's once again, it goes back to a little bit of the networking that I mentioned in the beginning, because you might not be an expert on, on sustainability, but you know somebody and then you can bring them in onto your project to help you out. But the main thing is, yeah, just you want to be sustainable and don't be, don't be um, just blown away by, oh yes, I can make a really awesome and cool looking product. Yeah, it can be cool looking, 
but there's so many things behind it that you have to think about. So it's, it's, it's sustainable. So just, I would say the best thing is, yeah, keep sustainability in mind, like keep it always in mind. Yeah. So uh, if you are, you are given a chance to talk to like your 18 year old self, what would you, what would be that piece of advice those piece of, uh, you know, the words of wisdom you would tell your past self or to any uh, aspiring designer? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the 18 year old self of me didn't even know that he wanted to be a designer. Um, I would say just keep on persevering and, and keep on pushing. That's, that's, that's the hardest thing because especially when you're young, it's easy to try out something like, okay, this, I don't like this, or it doesn't, the, it's most about, it doesn't give me an immediate feedback. It doesn't give me an immediate result. You just have to push sometimes through that and then you will see the results and the feedback multiplying more and more and more. Because I, I was a little bit lost and I didn't know what I was doing and I, and I doubted myself a lot. And it is, uh, as, as soon as I just found something that I liked and I, okay, let me do this a little bit more and more. And also with drawing, I went away from drawing so many times. If I would have just kept a little bit more with it, I think I think I could be even a bit more further. But in general, yeah, just keep on persevering and keep on what, what you like, keep on pushing, keep on pushing. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that does actually. Persistence and dedication is quite important qualities in any field of life. So um, our, I'm sure our audience must have a lot of questions to ask, and I would like to I would, I would like sort of to ask you uh, uh, read those out to you. Over to Saurav. Yes. So uh, the audience who's watching this, if you have any questions for Robert, do post them in the chat box. I'll read them out to Robert, and we'll maybe answer your questions. Yeah, so by the time audiences post questions, let me ask you a fun question different from design. Um, what would be, if you if you are a tree, if you would be a tree, what would that tree be? Like what species would you be in a tree and why? Okay, so this is a very hard question, first of all, because English is not my mother language, so I don't really know tree, <laughs> tree names in English. Um, and I never really had, I would say, um, who? that's a hard one. Uh, so I know, I think I, I know the, the, God damn it. You, you, you got, you got me. I, I will have to Google translate a little bit. I, I know it in German. So let me quickly find it in German and then I will push it. There we go. Right here. Oak, there we go. An oak tree. <laughs> it's, it's just because, uh, I have um, woodworking people in my family, and I have quite a couple of friends who work with wood. And I know that oak, oak is quite a preferred, strong, sturdy uh, wood for, for furniture and all sorts of materials like that. So I think I would like to be <laughs> a tree like that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, your experience at Leodel in like? How, uh, how it has really, you know, made, uh, like contributed to your industrial design journey? Uh, yeah, definitely. So it, TU Delft was uh, some of the best years in my life just because um, the education system back home was totally different. So I was, it, it was like sit in the classroom, we write something on the table, uh, on the blackboard, and then you learn that. And we arrived at the TU Delft and it was basically, hey, uh, almost every semester we had a big company who needed a problem solved. So at the TU Delft, I worked for Unilever, I worked for Volkswagen, I, I worked for all sorts of big companies through the university, just doing projects for them. And that was my main uh, semesterly big project. And the professors said, okay, so we'll give you um, the courses. We, you can come and listen to the courses but the solution is up to you. And then you have to figure it out. You are always a team. So another good thing was I learned about teamwork. I learned how it's not gonna go nicely all the time. 
there might be some people with whom you just can't really work well in a team. So that was that was interesting. That prepares you for the future. But it also prepared me that responsibility taking. I had I had to be responsible for part of the project. We had to work together after that. I had to do my own research, and the tools were there. I had to learn them and put it together. And then in the end, the professor came back and told us, okay, you did this well, here you didn't do well, or there you didn't do well. So it was also really nice because I had to do everything well, by, by my own. Nobody was holding my hand and teaching me how to do. And it was just such a, such a better learning experience than what I had before. And yeah, we had, so it's really nice because we had a lot of chances to do internships at uh, different uh, design agencies, but also just different companies who needed in-house designers. So yeah, I can really recommend whoever wants to do a master's in industrial design, yeah, Delft, go there. <laughs> no, but it, like in general, do you think it's really important to do a master's? Um, that's interesting. I'm not sure I can answer that because, so as I said, my bachelor was in mechanical engineering, nothing to do with okay. design. And my master's was the design, but I know quite a couple of people. So um, Marius Kindler, I had an interview with him on my YouTube channel. You could check that out. He only did his bachelor's and then he worked for two and a half or three years, maybe even a bit more at an industrial design agency. And then he became really good. I think he could also almost be considered, uh, well, not a senior, but he was definitely a media. So it's worth looking into that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessary to do a master's if you think that your bachelor's is, is good enough, I would say. All right. Uh, so, uh, so far, we don't have a lot of questions from the audience. There's one particular question over here. So, Robert, what do you think, how do you think ID could, industrial design could help out after the pandemic and the help like men, men like uh, healing the society or in general what do you think is the scope of industrial design after the pandemic that's a that's a very good question because there's definitely aspects of industrial design that go into interaction like right, right there's, there's there's a lot of people who come out of industrial design being uh, ux designer so user user experience designer and that that is something that is going to have to probably change quite a bit because not just with products but also with each other there's going to be a lot of change in how we interact what sort of experiences we get out of that and we will we will have to sort of set up new guidelines how to design for that and i think designers are are very good for that because then designers can look a little bit into the future see what what's now and then predict several sort of ways that we can come up with interactions with each other and we can come up with interactions for products that we will need in the future that, that are definitely helping with this social distancing at least for a while because I, I i think in the end this whole pandemic is going to have probably also longer lasting effects i, I heard somebody say that people will never be able to shake their hands again which i don't know i i, I can't imagine that but that is something that might happen so I do think that industrial designers, especially on the user experience, will have to think about this. As for everyday product design, I think there will be enough possibilities to come up with different new products that will sort of help with easing us into this new way of living. I hope that uh, answers the question. Yes, Robert, I think that was quite well answered. So the next question is, are there any kind of exercises you would do to like trigger critical, uh, triggering critical creative thinking? Like any kind of thing which you do, like a warm up you do before like jumping into critical uh, creative thinking or something? Um, yes. It's, it's a good thing because, so what I mentioned before also with uh, with the TU Delft that we worked a lot with teams and it sort of taught me how to do teamwork is one thing I learned is that it's much better to work with other people. So if I know for sure that I need to solve a problem, I usually, I do call up friends who are also industrial designers or who are in the creative field. And I ask them, Hey, can we just do a quick brainstorming session together? Because it's very important 
to have people who are thinking a little bit outside of the box, who don't think the same as you, who don't know the problem that needs to be solved or, or something like that. So then at least then you can one bounce out of ideas. They can come up with new ideas. You can combine those ideas. And it also, you need a little bit of fun. That's why I don't know if you guys do um, facilitation. Facilitation is usually very important when you have creative sessions because you might be in a room uh, if you've been with other uh, students together uh, on teams, you might be in a room together for a whole day. So you need a little bit of icebreaker in the beginning. You need to chill out here and there. So if you want to think creatively, you need to have fun. So I would say it's very important. One, don't do it alone. Get some help and also have fun. Have some fun breaks here and there because that will help you just reevaluate things and look at them differently. And uh, we've definitely found that the case too, because like even after like even after we've graduated, you know, like me and my batchmates are still doing projects together. Like that hasn't stopped, you know. And uh, we we feel the most comfortable doing projects with each other because we know, you know, uh, we can compensate for uh, what the other person lacks. You know, we know each other that well, and that really helps. We get so many perspectives on the same thing, and. I think collaboration is the key, you know, to having really good concepts. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. So it's it's all about co-working and co-creation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions, Saurav? Yes, uh, there was. Thank you for answering that, Robert. The next question which we have is key. When you're usually working with a client, you like a lot of us, we also find that in a situation key, the project or the client demands something, but you already have an idea and you and you like think that idea is going to work better. How do you deal with that situation? How do you convince the client or you take a step back? What do you do in that situation? Uh, so an idea is an idea. So I personally don't think one idea is better than another other unless I can un, uh, not undermine it, but like build it up and, and come with uh, um, well further explanation why I think my idea is better. So if you're in the front of the uh, a client and they have an idea and you have an idea, if you can explain it precisely like this, 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 and this is why I think my idea is better, then you should push it. Otherwise, there's also a little bit of a balance. Sometimes you want to do what your client wants, but sometimes if you know that, if you know why your idea, client's idea is not good, speak up. Tell him like, hey, I have experience here. I think this will not work well and that will not work well. And this is my idea and this and that. From there on, it's it's up to you and the client to, to keep on talking and see and see if he goes along. But I, I would say it's really just about being honest and showing that you, you, you can build up your idea why it's working, why it's functional. So you should always, whenever you're presenting ideas, be prepared. But think of think of it uh, when you finished your university, you have to defend your final thesis. Like basically, that's the client. Every time you have interaction with your client, you have to defend the, the thesis, which is your idea, what you're trying to sell him. So be be prepared for that. That would be my answer. All right. So Robert, do you think there are certain traits or like uh, values which define an industrial designer or do you make the definition of you, yourself for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think there are definitely a person has to have uh, several traits that will make them a good candidate for industrial designer. Uh, one is curiosity. You have to be a curious person. You can't be somebody who like, I don't care about that and that. No, no. You need to know, okay, how does that function? Why does the person interact with that? Like. Um, if you, if you stand in front of a train and you see people standing there and waiting for others to come out, okay, so why does that work like that? Who set up this, this social interaction? Like Many little things have to be interesting for you. So the more curious you are, I think the better suited you are for industrial design. Other thing is obviously creativity, like some sort of creativity has, has, to, has to be there. You like stuff like that. And I think with creativity, well, it's basically in the, in, the, in the name, you want to create something. So you have to have people who want to some sort of leave something behind. Like if you're the kind of person who feels like, hey, I want to leave something behind, I want to do something and leave it to the world, I think 
uh, industrial design is definitely a, a good uh, approach for you. I don't think specific skills like drawing or being good in 3D, that, that's, that's something you can learn. So that's, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. But stuff like being curious and wanting and being creative is, is definitely. And uh, teamwork <laughs> in the end, like it's industrial design because I think you mentioned at the beginning, we are generalist. You can't be, that, that's also why I, I find it hard to say yes to freelance industrial design because industrial designers can't do the whole gamut of what you learn in industrial design because you either are really good at sketching, but then you still have to 3D model it, you have to build it and you have to do user tests. So you mean you're good at sketching, you can 3D model and you're also amazing at talking with people. Yeah, you are one in a million. Most of us are not good with everything. So that's, that's why it's important to also be a good people person and, and be ready to work in a team because you will always need them. So yeah, teamwork, creativity, curiosity. <laughs> These are three traits that uh, I think are very important. Thank you, Robert. Robert, how do you like? How would you define bad design according to you? Ooh, this usually is very subjective in my opinion. But the the easiest way, like which is relatively objective, is usability. If something is is not usable, if 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 something is pretty, but first you don't know what to do with it, or you don't know how to use it. That that is that is definitely bad design. Uh, for me, I am a, not an Apple person, even though I use some of their things. But there's a lot of bad design in Apple for me. I just maybe it's not the Apple. Maybe I'm just too used to Windows. But so if there are certain use cues that you can't use, or, or like you expect something to happen and nothing happens, for me that's that's where a little bit of bad design comes in because you have to treat you have to treat your your audience or your client. As little dummies, because that's what I am when I'm when I'm approaching a new product. I'm I'm a little dummy. I, I don't know what to do. So that product has to be as easily usable as possible. And everything else is really up to taste. Like if 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 you don't like some sort of different shape languages, yeah, okay. I wouldn't call something bad design just because I don't like it. I, I don't like the, the latest Apple big computer, but it's not bad design. It's just not to my taste. If it's usable, it's 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 a good design. But yeah, usability, that's, that's the main thing for sure. Completely agree, Robert. So we all saw the uh, concept art you, you showed for uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Did you play the game? Yes, I am uh, still playing it. <laughs> uh, funnily enough, I, I, I didn't totally jam. It, it, it's fun, but it's not as fun as some other plays that I, uh, games that I played. It's uh, it's it's definitely a good game, better than their previous one, uh, and uh, I would recommend it. But uh, I'm also I'm not necessarily a console player. I'm very much uh, more of a computer person, so I'm still getting used to the whole thing. So yeah, that's the concept, and the concept art in that game is like really amazing for like anyone to see. So how do you like uh, derive inspiration for something like that, something out of the world? Um, that's, so that's fun for me. That's, that's the fun part about industrial design and, and concept, but industrial design for the entertainment industry and concept art, because the team, especially the team who was working on Horizon was really, really good. And we had a really solid foundation, which means that we had a really well-built world. So we sort of, okay, this is the world. This is sort of the laws of the world. This is why there's robots as animals now. And this is why the sort of the society went down. And then also the problem solutions, the, the, the problem statements that we have. Okay, we need, uh, so what do these machines do? Each of them has a specific task. This machine uh, makes the soil uh, irritable. This machine makes sure that the others are protected. Uh, this machine breaks down the rocks. Okay, and then from there on, it was really like, okay, so what sort of animals would be best fitted to move soil or break down rocks? So the, the, the best way to come up with things that don't exist is to look at things that already exist and then change them and add to them or take away from them. Uh, that's, that's, that's 
all that concept art is. If, if I want to also create some sort of interesting spaceship, okay, I'm going to take what I have now, a car. If I want that spaceship to be a family spaceship, okay, what do I need in a family car now? I need space for a driver, children, mother, and because spaceships obviously travel in bigger distances, we're going to need a living quarter. We're going to need a kitchen area. So that sort of gives blocks and elements to the spaceship. Uh, a car only has a small engine. A spaceship would need a bigger engine, so we need more blocks. And then you sort of know, okay, all these blocks need to be in a spaceship. Now I sort of need a, need a hull around it. And then, which is interesting, designers don't think about it a lot, but it is world building and storytelling because you have one world that it's in the future. Okay, so how do things work? But also a little bit of storytelling. Is it an old, decrepitated ship? Is it a really fast, brand new model? So all sorts of things like this will give you a direction where your concept is going. And yeah, this is not, that's also why I made sure to mention the vision and product design process, because when you envision these things, it's not just the product that you envision, it's also the, the, the whole, uh, uh, world around it. So that's, that's, that's how I think most concept artists work. At least that's how I work. And that's how many people at Berlin, the, the, the better this world is created, the better you can build your concepts and your props and everything in it. Yes. World building is like sort of your own game where you like get to play God or something. You get to create your own world and with rules and different histories. It's very interesting. So, so what do you think about the future of uh, design as you see it? Do you think technologies like augmented reality and virtual reality are going on his life and he's going to like have to work with it more and more as time passes by? Oh, I thought you were going to ask if we're going to be relevant now that AI can do everything without us. That, that would be more scary. No, yes. Uh, Augmented reality and virtual reality is, is definitely, I mean, it's, it's there. There are many really interesting 3D modeling and 2D slash 3D drawing apps for virtual reality that if you look, if you do a little bit of searching for it, you will see that, that they're already there and you see many people using it and it's fast and intuitive. So right now it's only about the technology not being 100% accessible. I mean, it's still, um, those virtual reality helmets and sets are still quite expensive, but as soon, I would say in a couple of years, when it becomes really affordable for everybody, I think we will see more and more. When I did my graduation, I did it with Volkswagen and to do uh, a mock-up, a uh, sort of a prototype, we were doing an interior related project, but we couldn't, I didn't want to build the whole interior. So what we did is just, we went into a room where you could 3D project the whole thing. So we just took a couple of chairs and then 3D projected the whole interior of the, of the car. And you really felt like you're in there. So in this case, you don't have to have, you don't have to waste time with quickly building and nicely modeling. No, you can do everything very quickly in 3D. Obviously the technology back then was super expensive, but I do think that it's becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And just like with, as we went from just purely drawing for industrial design in the beginning and then embracing CAD, now we will have to embrace virtual reality. And I think in the future, we will embrace more and more AI, like even right now. And I don't know if they're teaching you guys now, in my time, they definitely didn't teach us, but uh, generative designs, like a lot, you can do a lot of generative design in CAD already. So stuff like this will yeah. definitely take over. Yeah, and it's it's uh, in the talks right now. You know, uh, they're talking about integrating AI into the school syllabus, like not even university level, just at the school level. They want to, you know, integrate those that mindset, those values of AI, right? And uh, which is great. I, I think it's completely necessary to keep up with the times, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. so uh, remember, uh, yeah, and we were talking about how. Um, like um, people, uh, like industrial designers, uh, you know, have this immense pressure to kind of specialize and, you know, find a niche for themselves. So it's easier to, you know, find a job. Um, do you have any advice for those people who, uh, you know, haven't found their niche or who uh, truly feel like, you know, they're a generalist and that's where they want to 
is there any way for them you know to find their place in the industry uh if they're truly genderless i i would say i would say the best way to find what you want to do is really part in an internship in a design agency because then you also see what design is about because it's it's once again it's about the experience the more experience you have the more you also start having a taste for something because you're not going to you're not going to be your whole life no no i want to be a generalist because it's also going to be harder because if a company is set up of uh, different experts they just okay we're going to have five experts and these five together do everything much better than you do on your own so you're not going to have the same value so i would definitely say uh try and try and Ah, how should I say? Try and do an internship once again, like because you you want to work, and maybe it's even possible if if you work at a at a good industrial design agency, you might still stay a generalist because they might need you for this or that or that. But then at least that's gonna be your value within the company. Don't okay. don't go pants for it. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, okay. Sorry, do we do we have any other questions in the comments? Yes, we just have a, one or two more questions left. Sure. So yeah, so Robert, how would you advise students, college students, to network with industry professionals or maybe their peers and other colleges or universities? Um, yeah, once again, internships. Internships are very important and the easiest way to network with professionals. But you also have your professors, and also be organic and natural about it. You don't go up to people like, hey, I want to be part of your network. No, you go up like, hey, and I know this, this, and this about you. So make sure to, if you approach somebody, approach them because you like them. Approach them because you know something that they're doing and you want to know more about them. And then from that natural interaction, they will be able to tell you, maybe I don't know how to tell you this, but I have a friend who can tell you this. And then you already get contacted to the friend. And the, the same thing also with within within the, the close network of, of, of students. Just see who's interested in what, because people will always know more about certain things than you do. And through that, you can learn about new things, learn about new people, because you they are valuable to you and you are also valuable to them based on, on what you uh, on, on what you like. But as I said, the easiest way is approach people who you find very interesting for something or who you want to ask. Don't just go up because, hey, I know this person, he has a high standing and he has a lot of networks. That's, that's useless because why would they talk to you? But if you know them, if you go up to them like, hey, I love this product that you designed or I, I love this speech that you had and I, I read up a little bit more, can you tell me a little bit more about this thing that you talked about? So that's that's the sort of organic and natural ways that is going to be much easier for you to, to network. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert, for the, the insights. We just have one last question for you uh, from the audience. Do you, uh, in today's day and age, how do you think we should consume knowledge? Do you think books are, are as relevant as they used to be? Or do you follow books on your own? Or would you recommend books to people? Uh, oof, that's that's a good question. Uh, so I am sort of a product of this. I don't know, healthy or not healthy. We'll still see in the future of this generation of consuming everything on YouTube, and that's <laughs> that's what I find is. But, but the, the fastest way for me to to get new information. But at the same time, I do have a couple of design books, and I, I do have, so as, as I said, if I know people that I really like what they're doing and I want to learn that, I will buy their books as well because I really want to go deep and learn everything. I don't necessarily follow uh, or I'm not subscribed to design magazines or stuff like that. Most of what I do is I really, on, on YouTube, the people I follow on YouTube and the reading that I do, other than the, the couple of design books is, uh, articles like if somebody mentions something interesting, yes, I I do the research and I and I read up on it. But yeah, I am I am a little bit of this short attention span, new generation as well, and the, the YouTube's give gives me the the 
amount of information that I need. But yeah, I, I, do, I do think there's still value in, in getting books. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think everybody can agree with that, like <laughs> with YouTubing and Googling everything <laughs> pretty much. So yeah, definitely. And Sapna, uh, do you have anything you want to ask us or like, uh, do you want to know anything about uh, design in India? <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was curious, uh, so I asked you guys before, uh, when we had a little bit of uh, pre-chat, how, how you set this up, and I'm just curious, for how long is this is this uh, going, how many years are you doing this now? So uh, our, uh, our course is uh, a full foundation, and everybody is, you know, in a common discipline where we're taught the uh, basic principles of design in general, so there's no... Um, there's no demarcation like communication design, graphic graphic design. You know, it's all it's all one big bucket. And then uh, in the second, uh, third, and fourth year, we you know uh, third semester onwards we specialize. So we pick our streams. And uh, our, our university offers um, communication design, industrial design, and textile design, which are so diverse. <laughs> and uh, but but it's pretty cool because uh, inter interdisciplinary learning you know kind of helped us so much, and uh, you see the same thing being done in you know completely different processes, and so it's it's a, it's really cool and <laughs> we have a really cool community as well. So <laughs> yeah, I uh, hope that answers. It does, but it also just brings one interesting question to me that I would like like to ask, not just you, but just in general, also the, the people who are watching. Because so you had communication design, industrial design, and textile design. But for me, industrial design is such a vague and umbrella term because, as I said, it can be digital industrial design. So I, I still find it very hard to to put like put these three there because te- technically communication could go under industrial design almost and textile could go in- under industrial design as well. Exactly. So I think something that's very important for, for students of industrial design is to realize what people think when they mean industrial design because I feel whenever design, it can happen that all three of them means something completely different. Exactly. So you have to be in clear with this when you start your studies, but also when you finish your studies. That just because when you say that I'm an industrial designer, that, that can be so many things. So it's 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 interesting to hear how how your university at least uh, uh, branches off there. Yeah, and I mean I've seen so many people like shying away from using the term industrial designer as well because like they don't know how people will perceive it. You know, people are, you, usually end up asking you what does that really mean, especially in India where it's not you know a very established profession right now. So you kind of have to tell them like product design and you know <laughs> automobile furniture. There's there's so much to it. Like, ev- but then they're like everything's a product. What do you design? <laughs> so yeah, yeah it's a, it's a whole thing. I mean, <laughs> nice. Well, I I think uh, I think that's it from me. But I am I am I'm very thankful that you guys invited me, and I do hope that uh, your students got something out of this uh, this uh, little interview. No, I'm sure they did. And thank you so much for taking time out to do this. I'm sure you're extremely busy with everything. And uh, cool. Um, check check out his Instagram. Uh, it's at uh, Robert L. Kiss. And uh, his YouTube is Robert Laszlo Kiss. And, and all the links will be in the description. So be sure to check that out. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> it, was, it was really lovely talking to you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for the nice question. It was a very good conversation. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.